Chimir is a distant planet. It is defied by waves of life brought from Earth and set free to evolve independently in this new context. The indigenous life of the planet, swarms of microbes called magic by the people who live there, are what harvest Earth organisms and make copies on Chimir. Aminoids are shelled cephalopods, which are iconic creatures long associated with the age of dinosaurs. Despite the resemblance, they are closer to squid and octopus than they are to modern nautilus. Although extinct on Earth, indeed going extinct at the end of the Cretaceous, much like dinosaurs, aminoids persisted on Chimere in great abundance and diversity. As on Earth, orders of aminoids often easily identified and associated with different dynasties, helping Chimeran geologists identify the age of formations in which they are found. Aminoids of the order Goniatitidae are among the first animals harvested from Earth, and rapidly spread throughout the marine habitats of Chimere. Having a vast quantity of offspring, unusually long lifespans for a cephalopod, and few predators, they overtook the seas of Chimere within a few thousand years, and were instrumental in processing the waters in ways that favored Terran life. They were most successful in deeper inland seas, not coastal waters or open ocean. The shells of goniatites were held together by fairly simple waves of nodes and saddles, and were vulnerable to pressures both from predatory bites and even water pressure. Although they're not particularly proficient swimmers, goniatites had few predators in this early stage and became one of the most successful widespread marine fauna. There was a diversity in their diet, but had most success as filter feeders who specialized in particulates of algae and magic abundant in the seas of the First Dynasty. In the aftermath of the asteroid impact that concluded the first dynasty, most of the goniatites went extinct. A few held on, but as more derived keratites were collected from the harvest that built up the Permian dynasty, goniatites were pushed to the extreme specializations, and most went extinct fairly quickly. Keratites were the next aminoids on the scene, and defined the Permian dynasty. They were distinguished from goniatites by having more complex lobes which connected the chambers of their shell, making them far stronger. They could dive deeper because of this, and were therefore more widespread, although they were still fairly passive swimmers, and most were filter feeders. They replaced the few remaining goniatites in a geological blink of an eye, and their rapid and cosmopolitan distribution meant they became a geological marker for the Permian dynasty, just as goniatites had done for the first dynasty. The Permian Dynasty ended in fire as volcanic activity left the tropical continents and seas devastated. The periods of Chimeran history on Earth that correspond to the Jurassic and Cretaceous and very few aminoids, and it was actually nautiloids which dominated during this time, making them a more useful geological marker. True ammonites were harvested during this time, and they were found in Earth since the Jurassic, but they were often relegated to specialization. One clade of filter feeders supplanted their nautiloid competitors by being more mobile and selective, but in times of abundance, this adaptation brought little advantage. Two others entered the deep oceans courtesy of their shells, sporting interlocking lobes and saddles, with the most successful feasting on particulates in abyssal currents. The others were active predators, competing with squid for abyssal fish and other cephalopods, and sometimes venturing toward the surface, especially at night. The Arab period which preluded the Tyrant dynasty caused a spike in marine acidity which led to a mass extinction more potent than on land. Food was scarce, and in this context, the more dynamic hunting of ebonites enabled them to oust the nautiloids. The abyssal filter feeders also saw great success at this time, as deep currents were generally less impacted and had more reliable nutrients from trench volcano activity. The Tyrant Dynasty was especially favorable to ammonites, which thoroughly outcompeted the nautiloids, which are extinct in modern Chimere. The clades at the time survived the dynastic extinction and persist to this day. Their filter feeders are especially successful, with two clades forming a highly successful bond that continues to this day, the Ladigrim, or washers, and the Petarim, meaning waxers or polishers. Washers purify and make clear the waters as they feed on particulates of any kind, with iron stomachs that can process almost anything with seemingly minimal negative impact on the cephalopod, 
and the polishers specialize in algae which grow in clear waters that might otherwise trigger algal blooms. Other species contribute to this cycle, but the dynamic of washers and polishers has made the waters of the inland sea clear to an unprecedented degree without the toxic algal blooms that so often devastate ecosystems in their absence. Polishers are never as abundant because of their degree of specialization, and the Kalin have noted that their absence from waters often results in toxic seas. Because of this, all species of potterine polishers are considered sacred to the Kalin and protected by conservation laws of both Empire and Republic. There are freshwater species of both found in the Great Lakes of Picardia. It is not known how they came to be found so far from their marine habitat, but their filtration of these deep lakes is responsible for its clarity and health of the waters. Both species are also found in the Gulf of Iritame, where they are popularly harvested and exported to freshwaters throughout the known world. Bathhouses often have a few Ladigurim washers, all that is needed to both purify the waters and make them crystal clear. There are over a dozen generalist species also found throughout the marine habitats of the known world, including reefs, meadows, and open water taxa. Although ammonites are the only ammonoids in the known world, iridescent shells traded from Kaishel with simplistic goniatite saddles and nodes are still found in their inland sea, suggesting a potential holdout of this clade long thought extinct. Naturalists of Bolondokoi have identified a number of these goniatites often lumped as ammonites in specimens brought north by currents and upwells. Thus far, no specimens have been found alive, but the lineage has been confirmed as extant by at least three species. The krakens, notoriously giant cephalopods of the deep oceans, have long intrigued naturalists and sailors alike. Although the term, and its original Chimeran words, have long been assumed to be a natural grouping, recent study suggests that there may be as many as four distinct clades that make up the krakens. Some are squids related to cuttlefish, at least one is likely an octopus, and there are a few ammonite clades of kraken, one with spiraling shells and another with straight shell. Among the largest of the krakens, Chnanluk is a spiral-shelled predator of the abyss which will often rise to the surface at night to feed before retreating back to the depths during the day. While ammonites, as a general rule, live much longer than typical, one to three years of most cephalopods, Chnanluk can live for up to a century, and their shells can become impenetrable forces up to five meters tall by this time, although most do not reach these dimensions. In the mythology of the Aknuk, there is a great kraken who is the ruler of the abyss and hoards all the treasures lost to the depths and all secrets ever whispered to the waves, and is usually depicted as a giant chnanluk whose shell is larger than the hull of the greatest ship. A relative of this ammonite, the common kraken, is common in the inland sea, a prolific hunter and scavenger. Although their shells are an almost metallic gold, very little is seen through the algae and seagrass which often grows upon their shells. Largest of the straight-shelled ammonites, the scimitar kraken, can reach lengths of up to 9 meters, but weigh far less than the chanluk. For all their might and defenses, ammonites are not without their predators. Some, like the Mosasaur Ebeth, can break into shells with their powerful jaws. Others, like the common squid, will bore holes into the side of the shell to withdraw the ammonite backwards, although this is not always easily accomplished, especially if the ammonite is past about half a meter in size. The Catanook is an elasmosaur which tends to specialize in hunting abyssal squid, but they will grab hold of an ammonite while it's out of its shell, thrashing it about to wrench the cephalopod from its defenses. Perhaps the most peculiar and specialized predator is the Wakatelu, a therocephalian which came to the known world from the distant Permian Islands. They are experts at hunting ammonites, using their tusks or fingers to open the aptyche, then high-vaulted pallets to suction-extract the cephalopod. 
quick eviction. No mercy. Ammonites are culturally significant to many Chimeran peoples. They are the symbol of the Great Library, with their many collection vaults designed to spiral into the earth to unknown depths. The Kalin also view them as representing a wide range of virtues, including artistry, mathematics, adventure, wisdom, and clarity. There are many manifestations of their principal god of storms and calm, the destruction and life-giving power of the sea, but when personified, this deity is usually sown with ammonite shells growing from her brow as horns. The Kentrim call her Melrahim, the Horned Queen. Cheers to the Siren Lord for sponsoring this episode. Ammonites have long been planned as part of Chimere, but I didn't know much about them, and I appreciate their guidance and prep for the script and artwork. My new anthology, Songs of the Inland Sea, is out and available for order. Although there aren't any featured Ammonites, the marine habitats of Chimere are a setting for most of the stories within. I'd love it if you call up your local bookstore and ask them to order the ISBNs listed below and in the description. I appreciate if you've got to use Amazon, but Ingram distributes to most bookstores in most countries, so it should be available, and supporting small and local businesses is super important. Thanks to the Siren Lord for this sponsorship. Shout out to my Patreon patrons for your support, and gratitude to you for watching this episode. Cheers, folks!